Hey guys, this is Art, and today I want to talk to you guys about, um, you know, antagonistic manipulation tactics. The reason why I want to talk about this is because, in my experience, this covert antagonism, this tactic that the narcissistic parent will use with their, with their kids, this to me is really the key. The, the, the key in which this is how they make themselves out to look good and this is how they keep their hands clean so to speak um, while making you look like the bad guy and making you look like you know you're a terrible person and you treat your parent very poorly and so on it's through this kind of covert manipulation that um, uh, this antagonistic manipulation so to illustrate that I'm gonna tell you a little story 12 I was 12 13 years old when I it dawned on me for the first time that something wasn't right in my household and with my mother that something wasn't right I was about 12 13 when I first discovered antagonism, when, I, when it first dawned on me that my mother was actually antagonistic, even though I did not have the words to explain it, I could not explain it to anyone. There was no knowledge about narcissistic abuse during the 90s, right? Uh, this was not something that I could explain as a child, but deep down inside for myself, I knew, I knew. Um, you know, when I was a young, young girl, I was actually uh, very unhealthy, you know. I was uh, angry and um, I was jealous. Uh, I was uh, resentful because when I would make friends and I would see them living life with healthy families, I wanted to be them. I wanted that life, you know, and I made a friend, uh, let's call her Mary, her name was Mary, and uh, like my first high school friend, like beginning of high school, like the first year of high school, well, I was about 13 at the time, I believe, and um, so I made a friend, and um, you know, when I went to her house for the first time, it was so beautiful, her house was so clean, and her mother was so present. She was healthy, she worked, she drove her daughter to places. And I would actually, I often would tag along, like she would tell me, oh, my mom is taking me to the spa for the first time for that first leg shave or whatever, you know, mother, daughter, you know, the mother teaching the daughter how to care for herself and that kind of thing, you know. And I would like tag along just you know I would just tag along and, and you know the mother was so healthy and so caring and she would do all these things with her daughter that were like normal me in my case I wasn't allowed to shit to uh, cut my hair I wasn't allowed to have earrings because only cannibals wore earrings um, I, I, I she would dunk my head in, in these in this these herbal mixtures because my hair had to be blonde like that was the obsession I had to have blonde hair and as it was going darker that meant so that meant that I was becoming uglier and uglier she didn't drive me anywhere um, there, there was no absolutely no there was nothing um, nothing you know it was nothing normal you know it, it was a very unhealthy dynamic obviously and so I met that friend and I saw what healthy looked like and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, and, and so I wanted to be her, you know, I remember as a 13 year old girl, I was like, wow, you know, she, she's so beautiful and her parents are so healthy and her house is so clean and everything is so wonderful. And, um, you know, I became a bully. I bullied, I was a bully, actually I bullied my friends, you know, I was very unhealthy, I was very jealous, and, um, you know, I, I, 
I was resentful that she would get all these wonderful things while I had to go home at the end of the day. And what was waiting for me when I opened that door was always, uh, you know, associated with pain, you know. And so, yeah, after about a year or two, uh, obviously, you know, we got into a fight and she left and she left and that was the end of that friendship. And I, that was the first time that I really mourned like a, like a, the, a loss of a friend, you know, that was like a, you know, her, her, her parents really like took, you know, they, they drove me everywhere. I was welcome to all their outings. Uh, at school, I was always partners with her for everything, you know. And then, and then that was, and then suddenly, like that was lost. And and she was right to do it. Like I said, I wasn't a healthy friend. I was, I wasn't a healthy friend. Of, I was too jealous, you know, of what she had and I, what I, what I lacked. And so I started mourning that uh, that friendship loss. And you know, I would cry. And and I and then I confided. I told my mother. The, of the friendship loss and I cried for many days and I was very sad and I told my mother that I was so sad that I lost that friend and I told my mother everything I told her everything about that when it happened and then it started the covert antagonism so I would I would be downstairs doing something she'd be vacuuming she stopped the vacuum and she looked at me and she was like, um, how's your friend Mary doing? And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't talk to her anymore, you know, as you know. And she would be like, shame. She was a very lovely girl. She was so pretty and so beautiful. It's a real shame that she couldn't hold on to her, you know. Okay. Next day, she's flipping through a magazine. Oh, look, look at this model. She looks exactly like your friend, Mary, yeah? That haircut, that's exactly the haircut of your friend, Mary. I wonder how she's doing, you know? She was such a wonderful girl, you know? It's such a shame, such a shame that uh, you couldn't hold on to her. Next day. Oh, look at uh, this shirt. It wasn't it, this shirt. Wasn't that shirt that she wore that day on that outing where Mary was there? It was day after day after day. She would bring this up constantly. Now I was young. I was like thirteen. So after a few incidents of this, I started to react. Mom, stop talking about her. Please, this hurts me. I'm mourning her. Please. And I, I would get really upset. And then she would look at me and she'd go, how dare you get upset with your mother? How dare you? All I'm doing is talking about a haircut. All I'm doing is talking about a haircut. And now you have to turn around and talk to your mother with such disrespect. And she would, and then the rage would come on. The neighbors would come in and I would be crying. And she would, and, and what's going on? What's going on? The neighbors would say, you know, and I was just talking about a haircut and she's reacting like, like, I don't even understand. How can I have a daughter that's this terrible and this horrible? I was just talking about a haircut and she would play victim and I would be punished. This went on for months, for months. I was young. I did not suspect that my mother was actually doing this to hurt me on purpose. But one day, it was the usual. She, I was doing something, she turned to me. I wonder how Mary is doing, you know? It's been a while since you guys talked. I wonder how she's doing. And in my mind, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything, you know? And at the, I, I was 12, I had no therapy, I didn't know how to deal with this. But I said to myself, you know what, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just not going to respond. She did this a few more times. I didn't respond a few more times. Even though it really bothered me and I wanted to cry. I pretended uh, that it didn't bother me. And then she stopped. She moved on to the next vulnerability, the next thing, the next secret that I told her. You know? And that was when I realized, wow, when I tell her things about myself, she, 
she brings them up and she twists them. She twists them into me having a reaction. And then I have a reaction and then she plays victim. And then I am punished by everybody in the household. This is something that she's done from, you know, very young all the way beyond adulthood and onwards, you know. Um, it's taking, you know, and it's, it becomes as easy as, and this is true, as easy as uh, we have guests over and we're at dinner and then, oh, this food is delicious. Didn't Mary like that kind of food too at the table with guests around, family, whatever? And I would look at her and I would give her a death stare. And that's all everybody sees. All they know, all they saw is my mother, she cooked food, there was a gathering, and she just said, you know, didn't your friend, blah, 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 blah. While she knew that I mourned the loss, while she knew, while she knew exactly what that very, what, what that very subtle conversation would do to me. Nobody, when people don't know what's going on, people don't know the backstory. All they see is dinner and then that narcissistic parent mentioning something that they know is a vulnerability to you. But nobody else knows about this. Nobody else knows the fights that happened before leading up to that conversation. Nobody knows the vulnerabilities that you confided in that parent. And of course, to add to that, from that point on, and that's for any relationship that, if there was a relationship breakup or anything like that, from that point on, if she was displeased with me, without fail, she would say, that's why Mary left you. No one could ever love you. That's why she left you. No wonder she left you. Nobody could ever love someone like you. You deserve to be alone. This is how my mother treated me when I was 12, 13, 14. You know, you become so reactive as a result of these very subtle, covert, vol like um, picking at your vulnerability. You become so reactive. And, and then you become super reactive, super triggered. All they have to do is, is just say, you know, like in my case during that time, all she had to do is say the word Mary. And that triggered me because she knew I was mourning that friendship loss. And then she used that situation repeatedly over and over and over and over again to elicit a reaction out of me that she knew she could because I was just a child she knew she could do that and then she would use my reaction to that I'm gonna tell you another story I'm gonna try and make this quick but this is another story this is a story that's a lot darker um, you know I married um, a man that's not from my culture uh, he's from Asian culture and his family I, I you know I was traveling abroad and I lived abroad and I met my husband there and by the way my husband is amazing he's fantastic but he also comes and he also comes from a narcissistic family system the both of us are no contact actually the both of us are no contact with both our families and um, when he chose me, when he wanted me to marry him, when he decided that he wanted to be with me, his family disowned him for that because I was white. It was racist. It was racism. His family wanted him to only marry another Asian girl. They could not accept that he would marry a white girl. His mother, that's something else. That was another experience in my life. You know, I never experienced racism in a way that I did with that side of the family and when I came back to my home country and I had to go through a period where I had to have a place to stay while we figured out uh, you know the, the immigration papers and after, I was abroad for 10 years eh? so I had, I, I had to have a place to stay for the transition to, to get a job and this and that and so I had to go back to that house during that period and my narcissistic mother said to me 
when we told her what happened, she would rather side with racism, with a racist woman, than with her own daughter. She said to me, you make one mother suffer, you make all mothers suffer. And then from that point on, she used that situation she would leverage that situation, what happened to me, what I experienced there, as proof that there was something wrong with me as a person. And so you got the story of when I was 12 years old, and then you have the story of when I was 30 years old, okay? That subtle antagonism, they will take your deepest vulnerabilities that they know about you as their child, and then they will use it's very subtle it's a word all they have to do is one word and you go off because they know your deepest pain they're your parents they're they're you know they they you know they're your parents and if you if you make mistakes if if they see if you go through things if you have a breakup if if something happens they will use all those situations against you to to control you they know it hurts you they know that that what causes you pain and so they will use those situations to trigger you to trigger a response out of you and you react rightfully so but the thing is that this is done so covertly that nobody knows what's going on only you and the narcissistic parent know the whole story nobody else knows why one word would trigger you in the way that it does now, I want to talk to you about, um, when it comes to this, um, the Grey Rock Method. Now, a lot of you probably know already the Grey Rock Method, okay? But I want to talk about it because it, it's not just the simple act of, you know, shrugging and nodding and remaining calm and not engaging, which is, that's what the Grey Rock is, right? Um, you, you have to you basically have to stop um, giving parts of you information about yourself, information about your emotions, information about your feelings to the narcissistic parent. You can't do that anymore. So your interactions have to become like, mm hmm yeah, sure, okay. If you say so, thanks for letting me know. You don't engage, you know, you respond with like brief, short sentences and you exit the situation as soon as possible. But I wanna talk to you about the Grey Rock Method because something that you need to know is that when you employ the Grey Rock Method, it will get worse before it gets better. And I think that this is something that might not always be talked about. When you gray, when you gray rock, and this this is something that I experienced. I started after a point, I started gray rocking. I learned how to gray rock my mother, but I noticed that the more I gray rocked, the deeper the antagonism, that covert antagonism, got. The more I gray rocked, the more the deeper she would dig into my vulnerabilities. She would even go as far as go into full rage episodes because I wasn't reacting anymore. She would do have full, full on rage episodes because I would go, I, I would not give her what she was seeking, that, that reaction to the antagonism that she was craving. So I'm gonna explain it to you like this. If you've ever seen a, witnessed a street race, either in a movie or, you know, real life, um, the way that the cars rev up their engines as the count countdown starts, you know, vroom, vroom, they become louder and louder and they just wait for that green light so that they can go and, and, and you know, unleash the power. That's what happens with a narcissist and when you start to do the gray rock method, method they will start to dig it more and more and more and more they will you know it, it will get worse before it gets better this is my experience you know with a narcissistic parent it will get worse before it gets better so when you do i've seen you know i've seen people say like the gray method doesn't work because it it it's sort of they get worse when you do it it's not that it doesn't work is that you have to continue doing it no matter how 
deep they and deeply they antagonize you and the more that you gray rock the more that will they will antagonize you in the beginning until they reach a point and that's when they will stop and they will get bored with you you know the gray rock method is not i don't think it's designed to change to to like it's not going to fix the narcissist it's just a method to to protect yourself not to don't give do not give any parts of yourself to the narcissist anymore. Every time that you react, every time that you give, you, you get angry and you explode at them, they get what they want. Every time that you explode, they get what they want. And so when you do the gray rock method, you got to expect that there will be a period where it's going to climb up higher and they will dig more and they might rage. They might really like, you know, um, you know, really try to get you to react. And this has been my experience, you know, growing up, of course, I didn't know what the gray rock method was, but I tried everything with her. I tried not saying anything. I tried being nice. I tried being the therapist. I rebelled completely. I went angry. Uh, you know, I tried all the methods and no matter what I did, it always, she always escalated the fight and, and, and she always got what she wanted out of it, which was a reaction. And then everybody looked to my reaction, everybody looked to how I responded to this woman, and they looked to me and they said, it's you, it's your character, it's your reaction, you're the one, you know, you're the one who doesn't behave around her because they did not, they did not see the covert manipulation, they did not see, they did not see how one word, what one word meant. They don't know what the word Mary meant, you know what I mean? They didn't see me cry and mourn that friendship and how she suddenly looked through the magazine and go, look, she looks just like your friend. I wonder how she's doing. Why are you reacting? Why are you acting this way? You know what? No wonder she left you. And, and then the enablers walk in. So listen, do the gray rock method. That's what you got to do if you're still dealing with them any kind of narcissistic individual you gotta go gray rock don't give them any parts of yourself even when they dig into your deepest vulnerabilities and you want to fight back you want to defend yourself remember that silence is also a boundary and there's a difference between silence as a means to protect yourself and silence that in the way that they do it and which is designed to hurt you and punish you. It's not the same thing. What you're doing is silence to protect yourself. Silence to protect yourself because that's all that's left to do. When you have a narcissistic parent who is so evil, who is so sadistic that they will purposefully use their child's weak points as that child grows up to antagonize them. To get a reaction out of that child so that they can continue play victim because they are addicted to the attention that they get from victimhood they are addicted to the attention that they get from victimhood they love it they love it and so when you react you give them that pass you give them that reason to continue behaving like victims and then they will use that against you so you got to go gray rock, but remember that it will climb up before it gets better. Don't budge. Don't budge. Don't, don't give it to them. Do not give it to them. I know that how deep this evil can get. And it's so painful. And like in the aftermath, once, once they're not in your face anymore, go for a run, go work out, go, go talk to someone, do what you got to do to let it out of your system. But don't do that in front of them. Do not give them that. Do not give them the satisfaction of seeing you hurt. Do not give them the satisfaction of knowing that they have power over you. Because when you react, that means that they took away your power. They succeeded in taking away your power. Do not give that to them anymore. Don't react serene. You can also do yellow rock. 
in some cases you go, no, I'm good, and you do it with a smile. You know, oh, no, it's fine, I'm good, thanks, you know. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem, but, you, you know, it's kind of like this, you play dumb, you know, uh, kind of like, okay, you know, you, you can do like a, it's a, it's a twist you, you put like a it's it's sort of like you, a toxic positivity for a purpose you know you can it can do it that way or you can just literally just you know very very peaceful and just don't give it to them anymore don't give them what they're seeking for be a rock and no matter what they say to you or how deeply they try to hurt you don't respond your silence is a boundary remember that with a narcissistic parent, your silence is probably your best boundary. Because whatever you say won't register. It's, this is not a communication issue, okay? They, the way they operate is, is very dark. The way they operate, this is not, there's nothing that you can say that will change how they operate, their mentality, you understand? That's why silence is your best weapon. So I hope this helps you a little bit and I want to thank you all so much for like all your comments and for participating and for talking about your experiences, you know. Um, we got to get together. This is what we got to do, you know. We got to, we got to, it's good that we share these experiences with each other because we will give each other that validation, you know, as survivors that, that, you know, our own families will not give to us, right? We can do that together as survivors of narcissistic abuse. We can validate each other, um, you know, together. And so always remember, I love myself, I trust myself, and take good care of yourself.